I am so thrilled to be joined now by longtime Olympics reporter, Andrea Joyce. I feel like that's not an adequate description, Andrea, of everything that you've done from Tokyo. Thanks for being with me. You know, it's interesting. I know you have a couple minutes and I wanna get as much in as we can. So I'll just jump right in here. I I've covered a couple of Olympics. I know you've covered a number of different games. And one of the things that's always fun for me is you prepare and you prepare, and then you get to the games and the stories that you either thought might develop in some way, develop in a completely different way, or stories that you didn't see coming just kind of fall right in your lap. And gymnastics has been at the forefront of these games for a number of days now. So I'm just curious with your Olympic experience, what are you ultimately gonna take away from these games? Um, you know, it's as you say, like it's, it's a cliche, but expect the unexpected. I think that you know, you're watching for months and months, um, Simone being built up, you know, she's really truly the star of the game. She's in, you know, every time you turn on the television, she's in another commercial, her face is on billboards and she truly is the goat, the best we've ever seen and has never shown, listen, everyone's human and they have a moment of weakness, but she's never shown any vulnerability. And we saw a little crack um, at trials in that second day, but just truly all of us, and I, I'm not the expert, I've covered gymnastics for 20 years, but I'm not, I'm not a gymnastics person, but you know, Nastia and Tim are two Olympic gold medalists. You know, everyone just said, you know, it's, it's, everybody has a bad day um, and she's human. And maybe this is great to get this done now before she gets to Tokyo. But then when we saw what happened um, in preliminaries, I mean, it's, it's shocking. I mean, it was, it really took everyone by surprise. And then what unfolded after that was, was truly, um, truly remarkable and unforgettable for sure. I think a lot of people here watching Seaside uh, when when they saw your interview with her after preliminaries, I mean, if they were maybe, maybe if they were paying attention, they could have predicted, couldn't have predicted everything that happened after. But I think that was maybe the first indication for some of like, huh, that's that's not usual or that's not like her. I mean, when did you know, like, wait a minute, we might be dealing with something a little bit larger here? Um, you know, I think that when so so I noticed it um, actually in that first rotation of preliminaries, you know, when they showed the slow-mo of the vault and you could see her head and you could see her eyes and that she was lost and you know uh nastia called it the twisties you know it's the first thing that people ask me um you know when they know that when they find out that i cover gymnastics don't they get dizzy and so this isn't exactly getting dizzy but it is sort of like it's what we would think like if you get lost in the air figure skaters have it you know and it's a scary scary thing to not be able to find the floor and to not and listen the 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 level of danger for her like the what she does is so complicated and so sophisticated it's dangerous so she did the absolute right thing by pulling out because it's not if a football player has has a mental you know brain freeze or whatever he might throw an interception but he's probably not going to die in her sport what she's doing if she's not completely focused and completely confident, she could she could seriously hurt herself. So I think that we started to see in in the interview afterwards. You know, as as you know, at the Olympics, they start. You know, NBC is very close to the front, and we're one of the first people to interview her. And then she goes down the line and ends up talking to about fifty different people. And by the time she gets into the press conference, I think she had a time to take a breath and really had an opportunity to talk much more. We're restricted to a minute and a half where we are. And she did say it was not physical, it was mental. And um, I, I think that that, for her to be able to admit that, for her to be able to have the guts to pull out with that kind of hype and build up, I, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm floored by it. I'm glad that there's been so much support. I mean, I know we all live in an echo chamber, certainly from what I've observed on social media, it seems like there have been so many names, prominent and not, that have thrown support behind her. And I think the point that you make is really important to underscore about the potential for life-threatening injuries. Because, yeah. you know, unless you're a really, if you're a gymnastics fan you and you really understand the difficulty of it, there's so much more at stake. I think that's really important. I just wonder, because you spent time with her, you know, what do you think happens from here? Do you get the sense, and I'm sure it's hard to tell, that uh, she's I, really going to be okay with this decision? I uh, oh oh, I th I think so, and I think that the support that she's received has blown her away. 
I think that she, you know, I, one of the um, posts that I saw, you know, something I saw her say was that she was so moved by all of the support and that she never really thought that she was anyone beyond her gymnastics and her accomplishments. And people were just reaching out and saying, we love you, we care about you, you're a human being. Listen, Michael Phelps is the guy who really opened the door for um, for so many elite athletes to be able to have the, the confidence and the, and the courage to be able to, to say, this, I'm not okay. I'm not okay with this. And Naomi did it, Naomi Osaka. Um, and I think that their legacies, you know, beyond all of the accomplishments and all of the gold medals and everything else, Michael Phelps' legacy and, and, and Simone's too, you know, this will be part of her story that she, what she did to shine a light on mental health um, is, is, is much bigger than any Olympic gold medal. Yeah, it's interesting, uh, Andrea, because you think about, I know you've covered so much tennis in the past, and you do have examples of these athletes like Marty Fish who have had these episodes, and, and but but nothing quite as high profile as Naomi Osaka, who is a global superstar, and then yeah. side, you know, Michael Phelps and Simone Biles are also global to a certain extent, but, you know, especially kind of hammering that point home domestically, you know, is that the difference for you here in terms of the lasting change because once that floodgate opened and you could argue as and give credit to Michael Phelps but you could argue what Osaka did in tennis was just kind of like the next level of all of this the way that she Absolutely. kind of went so public with it globally you know I, I I wonder is that the difference is that what's ultimately going to make make the difference because now you've got athletes coming out of the woodwork saying hey I'm also not okay yeah, no, no, I, I know, I, I absolutely believe it's true because, um, I mean, listen, you look at, um, I, I remember my dad had Alzheimer's, and you know, and this was years ago, and and my mother couldn't even say the word. She, she said, you know, the A word. You know, she, you know, there was such a stigma attached to it. Cancer. You know, people didn't didn't even say, you know, so, and then as people, you know, it's it's in that same kind of realm. Like we're at a, this is a pivotal moment where people are talking about it. And it's okay, and it's not. There's not a stigma attached to it because, I I remember back when I was young, and somebody said, you know, have you ever been to therapy? And I said, oh God, no, I don't want anyone to find out how crazy I am. You know, I mean, like you, you know, you didn't you didn't want that attached to you. And so for that to change is gigantic, and and it'll never go back. That's the best part is that it just is moving forward now. And so people who aren't Simone Biles and aren't Michael Phelps, who are just normal average people, are going to feel. Like they have, it'll be much easier for them to say, okay, I'm not okay. I mean, the, the trickle down effect, I think, will just be tremendous. You know, we, we kind of absorbed the Olympics back home here in the United States. I'm just curious what, what the reach of that has been in Tokyo. I mean, we, the, the way that I'm kind of absorbing these Olympics, watching them on primetime and then hosting them like everybody else is, wow, you know, the, the focus is squarely on, on mental health here and athletes being vocal in a way that they haven't in the past. Does it feel like that is true also in Tokyo? I, you know, it's a little hard for us to say because we're in a bubble. And so I keep calling home and saying, how is this playing at home? You know, every time I'm at an Olympics, it's so far away. I'm always calling home and saying, what, how is this being perceived? How, and, oh, well, people are thinking this, and sometimes it's not exactly what we're seeing, but here it's completely different because we are in a, in a bubble. Um, we're not in, an, in a total bubble, but we're, we're under quarantine, a loose quarantine for 14 days. So I'm on the balcony of my hotel. Um, thank goodness I have a balcony because you know, this is the fresh air that I get because we are only for 14 days, we can go from our hotel to our venue and back to our hotel. We can't go anywhere. We can't talk. We can't see anyone. We don't go out to restaurants. We don't. So there's no, I have no sense of how this is being perceived here. Now, by the other athletes I see and by the other people I work with in the IBC, you know, when I go to the IBC, the International Broadcast Center, you know, you get the sense that this is this is a, a big, big story, um, obviously. And um, beyond that, though, it's it's hard for me to tell. I'm I'm calling home to find out what's you know how it's how it feels for people back home. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, and then, I mean, I, I won't keep you too much longer because I know you got to run. But um, and then you have Suni Lee, uh, who really, I mean, it's like one of those things. that's the best, is it not the best? I mean, what an incredible so story. Not, not to, yeah, not to take away from anyone, um, but you know what, my 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 concern um, is that there will be people who will put a little asterisk by her medal and say, well, you know, she won because Simone didn't compete. 
which is which is not fair because I mean, listen, Simone is the goat, and on her best day, she's she's unbeatable, and every single gymnast on the planet knows that and SUNY and all of the other American gymnasts will tell you that anytime you come second to Simone and win a silver medal it really is a gold you know because it's Simone and then everybody else so you really so and and they believe that but on that second day of trials of the Olympic trials granted Simone had an off day but SUNY beat her on that day SUNY's score was higher and that was the first time in eight years that at a single night of competition Simone had been beat so you have to give an awful lot of credit for SUNY like she's got the goods and she is a spectacular gymnast for her to be able to come through with all of the distractions with everything that's happened and to be able to go out there and perform like that I mean I I've gotten to know her I've gotten to know her family and I'm, I'm usually pretty good about being objective and you know and and uh, and keeping my wits about me. But when she won, I mean, I thought, how am I going to do this interview? I'm like, I, like, I was, I was so emotional. I was, it was, um, it was really something. And you know, and again, not undermining anything that that happened with Simone, and not, I, I feel like everyone deserves, like major major kudos and props for for everything that you know the way that simone has handled herself and what she's done and the way that suny was able to just really rise to the challenge in that team competition when simone walked off the floor it's one one of the one of the good things about not having a crowd um, is that we can hear everything our microphones are picking up sounds of the olympics that we've never had before so we could hear simone say i don't have faith in myself and she, you know, after a vault, and she walked off the floor. And then all of a sudden, here's Suni. She's 18 years old. And she's standing there and she says, okay, we got this. We have to do this. We can do this. You know? And I thought, who, who are these people? Like, <laughs> like I think I would have just said, oh, take, get me to a couch. You know, just like, <laughs> I mean, I, I was just so in awe and so impressed by all of them. It's, re it's really been something. You've interviewed so many athletes. Is it, is it, what is it about about SUNY and her family that that really kind of got you? I mean, we we've seen the story now, but this is really our first introduction to her father and her family. I mean, what is it about about her and her family that makes you so emotional at the thought of having to interview her? You know, so so her dad had this accident and was paralyzed and you know, fell from a ladder um, two days before national championships in 2019. She didn't tell anybody. Her coach knew. She, her teammates didn't know. Nobody knew. We didn't know about it until after nationals. She ends up having a spectacular performance. We go on to world championships in October. So it's a couple of months at what? Well, yeah, a couple of months afterwards. And um, we, you know, we know the story now. And she's there and she's competing. And her father is in. Um, you know, is in the hospital, he's in rehab, he's already had his surgery, and she competed with such poise. And then I started to be in touch with them. And then, of course, we had COVID and we didn't have any uh, competitions for a year. But then when we got to national championships this year, I was in touch with her family and I would talk to her dad. Uh, no, no, it was before that. I would, you know, I would talk to them because they had not been able to go to a competition for three years. You know, wow. even before COVID, they could because he couldn't travel. He couldn't travel. So then when when trials and national championships came along this year, they got in the car and they drove. They drove from Minnesota down to Fort Worth for nationals. Then they drove to St. Louis for trials. And so every time she would compete, I would talk to him on the phone. And um, because he was the one who was the constant. She has a great relationship with her mom as well. But her dad was the one because she has siblings. Her mom was the one that had to stay home with all the other kids. And her dad would go with her and they would go to edge. He was at every competition by her side and he calmed her down. He's her best friend. So for them to be able to be at those competitions leading up to the Olympics was huge. And so as I got to know them and talk to them and, you know, I mean, I felt a little bit like a stalker, you know, because I'm like, hi, it's me, you know, <laughs> they've got better things to worry about. But um, but they were so gracious and so willing to help. And then when I called and said, NBC wants to do this uh, friends and family, they want to set you up wherever you're watching so that you can see her and she can see you and you can talk to each other after she, you know, competes. And um, it's just been uh, so heartwarming yesterday uh, before she competed. Uh, I, I called him and I said, so will you be set up at home again? Because they've been always at home with the iPad watching. And he said, no, we had to move it to a larger venue because so many people want to celebrate and be part of this because they're part of the Hmong community, which is a um, it's a minority uh, group from South Asia. And there are like 66,000 Hmong people in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, right? So it's a very close-knit community. And 
this this excitement has been building. They've helped raise money for SUNY's expenses. They helped make their home handicap accessible for, for, for John. So they're all in this and it's all for them too. So they moved it to a bigger venue. They had like 300 people watching her win this gold medal. I mean, you know, you can't, how, you know, it's just, it's just remarkable. There was a part of me that wanted to be there watching with them, you know, because it was so, so spectacular. Uh, it was, I have goosebumps just thinking about it. I mean, what an incredible moment and kudos to NBC too for figuring out a way to navigate what's been a very challenging Olympics, but I will yeah. say that parties at home have have been really engaging and really fun you know I thought we were all going to kind of get a little bit of like a zoom hangover or whatnot but you can feel the emotion Caleb Dressel another great example just lastly because yes. I know you got to run um you know you you've covered so, so many Olympics and this one even though this mental health story you're just right at the center of it and it kind of came out of nowhere but it had been tracking that way there's just a laundry list of other things you could point to with the weather and the and the virus and the pandemic and you know just all these challenges that these athletes have overcome yeah. so yeah. as you kind of as you and i know you're still in it so it's not really fair to propose yeah. this to you now but when you when you walk away from this one i mean will it be up there among the more memorable ones for you just because of how oh, it, you oh, absolutely absolutely i mean memorable for different reasons obviously but um but i you know as we were getting ready to go um, somebody said, well, it's not going to be the same. You're not going to have the excitement. There won't be people in the stands. How are they going to do opening ceremony? Athletes don't, you know, there's no, you know, that, that vibe is all missing. And I said, you know, I've done 15 Olympics. This is my 15th Olympics. And I said, but this will be the one for the rest of my life that people ask me about. Yeah. This will be the one that people will remember that the, during a time when, when there was so much heartbreak and so, um, so much tragedy, you know, in this past year, and for the world to be able to come together, um, even just to see these athletes from the other countries, to see Suni with um, with with her with the, with the women that she shared the podium with, you know, and to and to see them be able to embrace each other, and you know, because they've all been in this bubble, and to see them experience that, I I didn't sense that it was any less than, you know, it was big and, and it will be a moment, you know, it, it'll be a highlight of her life. And I think that for me, it'll be remembering how people came together, how we all, listen, it's not the same. You know how it is when you're at an Olympics, you know, at the end of the day, you get together with your colleagues and you have a glass of wine and you, you know, and you tell stories and it's, it's so, it's so amazing. And, and, you know, and it's different, it's different. It's not, I'm much more rested than I've ever been at any level. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I don't have bags under my eyes. <laughs> yeah, be real with us. We have one glass of wine. Sometimes we have two glasses of wine. Sometimes we don't get any sleep. <laughs> but, but, be, but because of that, you know, I mean, would I love to be able to explore Tokyo? For sure. Would I love to be able to do, you know, to go to a sushi restaurant? Absolutely, you know. But the the upside of all of it is is so much greater than... It's, it's not less than, you know, so that that's the way I'll remember it, is that it was just different and um, remarkable on many other levels. Yeah, well, you've done an incredible job. I know you, you're right in the middle of it, so I'll let you go. But thank you so much for the time and just for, for the insight. I mean, it has been a fascinating story that has dominated headlines back home. And I can tell you it's just been told in such a, a masterful way.